After being rained out of Mabira Forest, I returned to Entebbe, two weeks before my flight home was due and nine weeks after I'd left. As it happened, things didn't work out like that. A week before my flight was due, Uganda closed its borders due to COVID-19 and I ended up spending nine weeks in this room at Entebbe Backpackers. Most of this was during lockdown, but fortunately I was still able to visit the botanical gardens and look for wildlife. These large red termite mounds are a conspicuous feature here in the Entebbe Botanical Gardens. I've never seen the termites that make them, they only come out at night, but I have managed to film three other species of insects which utilise these mounds for their own purposes. Preying on the termites themselves is this assassin bug nymph. After sucking their bodies dry, it stacks the empty husks on its back. That's the shiny black mound you can see. There are usually three or four of these strange creatures moving slowly around on the mound or just sitting still looking very camouflaged. This is what the nymph eventually turns into, the warningly coloured adult. In addition to the bugs, most of the mounds had at least a dozen of these green tiger beetles scurrying around. I never saw one on areas of bare ground, only on the termite mounds, where I often found them laying their eggs, as you can see here. This female is thrusting her ovipositor into the hard mound in order to insert an egg. As you can see, it's quite an effort. The third insect in the mound utilising trio was this splendid potter wasp. She was flying back and forth to this mound in order to mine the earth from which it was made. She would use the earth to build her pot-like nests. The earth of the mound is very dry, so in order to make her malleable plaster, she mixes in water stored in her crop. She scoops the earth with her jaws into her front legs and fashions it into a ball. The finished pot will be filled with paralysed caterpillars to act as a larder for her developing larva. I looked for her nest but couldn't find it. On suitable nights, millions of winged male and female termites are released from the nest. Their mission in life is to mate and for the female to establish a new nest, but many of them just end up as food for spiders, stranded helplessly in their webs. In some termites, the large nest is placed underground and all you can see at the surface is these short ventilation chimneys. Under suitable weather conditions, thousands of the tiny worker termites would emerge from the chimneys in order to expand and repair them. The chimneys are tapered inward so what I want to know is, how do they know where to put their pellet of mud in order to create the taper? Especially as they're blind and cannot see what they're doing. Watch how each of the workers waggles its head from side to side in order to fix each of the moist pellets firmly in place. The slightly larger termites, with the prominent black jaws, are soldiers. They're patrolling the area in order to protect the workforce. To give you an idea of scale, the worker termites are only some four millimetres long. The 
I spent most of my time in the botanical gardens in the small area of original rainforest that remains there. That's where I found these strange, rather ant-like, brightly coloured bug nymphs. They belong to the family Choraeidae, sometimes known as squash bugs. By contrast, this spider is more than just vaguely ant-like, it's an amazing ant mimic. As it scurries around, it continuously waves its front pair of legs, just like the antennae being waved on a real ant's head. As the spider has eight legs rather than the ant's six, this extra front pair is put to good use. Just how good will be obvious from this genuine ant. See if you can tell the difference. Over the next five clips, score S for spider and A for ant. You should have scored S-S-A-S-A. -S -S -A. I'd only just finished filming the ant spider story when I came across this large female praying mantis chomping on an insect that she'd caught. Like any mantis, she doesn't waste anything. She consumes every piece of the prey, even the wings. Another stealthy predator is this white crab spider, a female, that's caught a honeybee. The tiny black flies are known as jackal flies. They often hang around predators such as spiders in order to take a share of their prey. A couple of days later was a bit of a bonanza for the spider. She'd caught this large blue pansy butterfly. When the butterfly landed on the flower without seeing the spider, she would have killed it rapidly with her quick-acting poison. This is what a living blue pansy looks like, feeding on a flower. Once or twice a day, I would tear myself away from the forest with its insects and spiders and head for the shore of Lake Victoria looking for birds. For these Egyptian geese, it's bath time. The hammercock is distinguished by having a family of birds all to itself. It also has, relative to its size, the largest nest of any bird in the world. At this period, Lake Victoria had flooded way up into the park, being at the highest level ever recorded. I often saw this mountain behaviour in the hammer crop, but I'm not sure what's happening. It's not actually trying to mate. Spiders are preyed upon by all kinds of animals, from wasps to birds. So it can pay to look like something inedible. This scorpion-tailed spider looks just like a piece of dead leaf that's floated down from above and got caught in a spider's web. 
It's not until it moves that you realise that it is something living. The huge webs of the golden orb weaver were quite common in the gardens and in other parts of Entebbe as well. The females are the giants among web building spiders. Note the gold sheen to the web. This female has caught some prey and is feeding on it. But it could be stolen by a tiny dewdrop spider, several of which are often resident inside each of the giant webs. They don't make a web themselves, nor do they catch their own prey. Dewdrop spiders also inhabit the webs of other large spiders, such as this one. Here a dewdrop spider has some small prey, probably which is stolen from the larger spider, seen here wrapping up an insect. The juveniles of this species are well camouflaged on a thick pad of white silk placed in the centre of the web. In mid-March, many of the spider's webs became clogged with millions of tiny gnats hatched from the lake. Their mating swarms resembled swirling clouds of smoke. The numbers were so huge that it made it quite difficult for me to work in the gardens. Somehow or other, in this mass confusion, males and females managed to locate each other and pair up. Its feathery antennae indicate that this is a male. The actual act of mating only takes a few seconds before they split up. Then for the females, it's back to the lake to lay their eggs. As well as gnats, there were stork-eyed flies seen here grooming its eye stalks. These are some of my favourite insects. And I spent nine weeks in Uganda looking for one. And at last I found one. The width of the eye stalks is used as a measure in male-male rivalry. One of the local guides told me that these warningly coloured moth caterpillars are found eating the leaves of this same tree year after year. Nowhere else in the world have I seen so many spiders, both as species and as individuals, as in the Entebbe Botanical Gardens during April. This is a kite spider, or spiny orb weaver, and it was very abundant. This female is spinning a fresh web. In order to explain what's happening in the next spider sequence, we need to take a look 
at one of the best spider books ever written, The World of Spiders by W.S. Bristow, which set new standards. Although sticking only to British species, much of the content is also valid for foreign spiders. I bought this book in about 1970, when I was just starting out in wildlife photography, and I was immediately struck by this drawing of a mating pair of spiders. It shows how the male has special adaptation for securely grasping the female's fangs while they're mating. A few years later, I managed to capture exactly what you can see here on still film, and it was used in several books and magazines. But it wasn't until we arrived in Uganda that I managed to capture it on film in the Entebbe Botanical Gardens, albeit in a Ugandan species rather than a British one. Here, a male at the bottom is just waiting for a few minutes until the female is ready and gives a signal. And he moves forward and uses his long fangs to clasp hers. And you can see them going around there. And she bends her body around so that he can mate. The act of copulation lasts about half an hour, during which time this position is maintained. And the male springs backwards and is away. During mating, the male inserts his palps, his mating organs, on and off into the female's body. Although normally unusually receptive to the male's advances, some females would repeatedly rebuff them. The male might walk around for a while, trying to elicit a positive response from the female, but often he'd just end up sitting next to her for an hour or two, waiting for a change in mood. Generally speaking though, the females always seem to be ready for sex and you see mating pairs all over the place. I often saw males acting as spoilers, breaking up mating pairs. And now, as we come to the end, a final challenge. Can you spot the moth caterpillar on this lichen? As well as living on the lichen, it also utilises it as food. The caterpillar's greatest enemy will be driver ants. These don't hunt visually, so camouflage will be useless in defence. And so, after nine weeks in Entebbe, I finally left on a special flight, organised very professionally and efficiently by the British High Commission in Kampala. And so a big thank you to them. Someday, I hope that I'll return to Africa. In the meantime, what follows is a song that I wrote that perhaps sums up all that I feel about that magical continent. Last night I had that dream again I gazed out across the great rift valley broad And slept beneath the velvet night And was awakened as a lonesome lion roared And up on high the vultures wheeled Flocking to a frenzied feeding spree Africa, Africa Red Murrum Road beneath the baobab tree Where herds of neat gazelles still wander free Last night I had 
that dream again I was back beneath the vast savannah skies Of Africa, that wondrous land Too often tortured by the sound of people's sighs Where politicians make their Promises to which they bid goodbye as power hunger grows. Africa, Africa, the land in which the great Zambezi flows, the land in which the whistling thorn tree grows. Last night I had that dream again I was back beneath the bright savannah sun Back home in the cradle of all mankind Where the long human story had begun And all around me Thronged. Parentless through eight, now such a drain Africa, Africa Betrayed by greedy leaders yet again Where corruption just intensifies the pain Again, a daydream that hit me in a flash. I saw an Africa where leaders quit and freedom ministers don't pocket all the cash. Where foreign aid goes, where it's meant not skimmed up by. High officials on the make Africa, Africa Where pink flamingos flood a bitter soda lake Africa, oh Africa Where hearts should always leap with joy but so often brave